It was such an unexpected turn of events. Uh, you know, to, to misquote what Churchill said about democracy, it's a hell of a lot better than the other alternatives. It was the product of struggle, of, of dreams, of imagination, and intense collegiality and intelligence. The Constitution still is the glue that holds the South African society together. Fighting apartheid for some was more dangerous than for others. My guest today was willing to look that danger directly in the eye and carry on the fight. Before going into exile in 1966, he was subject to a banning order, raided by the police, and held in solitary confinement for 168 days without trial. During his exile, he was even subject to a car bomb attack by the South African security forces. And yet, despite all of this, on his eventual return home to South Africa, he first helped to peacefully negotiate for South African democracy, and then went on to serve as one of the first constitutional court justices. He has been called the chief architect of the South African constitution and his contribution to the country is certainly immense. And so I am both awestruck and immensely grateful that I have the opportunity to talk to the Honorable Albi Sachs today. Hello, Mr. Sachs. How are you? I'm, I'm very, very well and feeling in quite an irreverent mood. So I'm going to challenge that very lovely introduction uh, in three respects. Uh, first of all, you said in spite of being banned, restricted, uh, locked up in solitary confinement, being blown up while I was in exile, losing on side of one eye, I went on to negotiate. It wasn't in spite of, it was because of. It was transforming the sword into a plowshare, the negative energy into positive energy. The other is I have to object to be calling, being called the chief of architect or a chief chief architect of our constitution. I'm happy to be called, I'm delighted to be called a significant or major uh, architect, but there were so many of us. It was a huge project, uh, and I think it's very important to establish our constitution was drafted by the elected representatives of the South African people. There were many, many, many who'd been in jail like me, who'd been in the underground resistance like me, been in Israel like me. Uh, that, that, that's the second aspect. The third is, is maybe the most cheeky of all. One of the very first uh, decisions we made when we sat at our first meeting as newly appointed judges, almost incredible, unbelieving. We've been fighting against, 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 and suddenly we are the judges upholding the Constitution. And one of the very first decisions we took was not to use the term my lord, my lady, or to be called honorable. So it doesn't mean I'm dishonorable, but it was actually quite an important move. We didn't use the language of decolonization then, but we wanted to separate ourselves from the formalities of power that went with colonial power, apartheid power, my lord, my lady in court. We weren't my lords, we weren't my lady. We were just justice, so and so, so and so. And we didn't want people to respect us because we had titles, honorable, justice, so and so. So even though I've been off the court for uh, more than a dozen years, I don't like being called honorable because it's repudiating one of the decisions we took. Now, that, that's gratitude for you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I, uh, I will remember that, and I will not refer to you as honorable anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to take it back to right at the start and um, of your life even. So where did you grow up, Mr. Sachs? So I was born at the Florence Nightingale Hospital in Johannesburg. And I mention that because it's right next to where the Constitutional Court is today, in the heart of the old Fort Prison. But I have no memory, obviously, of my birth, but even of my first years. 
because my mom separated from my dad, sorry, sex, General Secretary of the Garment Workers Union. She came down to Cape Town with little Albie, that's me, uh, and my even littler brother, Johnny, now sadly late, uh, to Cape Town. So I went to nursery school in Cape Town. I went to junior school in Cape Town, sex as it happened to be. I went to high school, sex high school in Cape Town. I went to university in Cape Town, and I went to jail in Cape Town. So all of these big features of my life were Cape Townian. I used to call myself a CTCP, a Cape Town Travelers Big. Very proud of, very proud of my Cape Town roots and 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 uh, connections. And so, what was it like for you growing up during apartheid? Did you witness any of the brutality that characterized the period? Uh, I grew up before apartheid, which formally came into power in 1948. So, I grew up during World War II, which was the world, the democratic world, and even the colonial world fighting against Hitler and Mussolini and Hirohito. Uh, but I grew up in a very progressive home. Uh, my mom used to say, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. And Uncle Moses wasn't Moses Cohen or Moses Kantarovich, he was Moses Kotani. He was the General Secretary of the Communist Party of South Africa. Uh, and my mother was his typist. And he used to joke that Comrade Ray had taught me to read and write in a night school, now I'm her boss. And he was my Uncle Moses. So I grew up in that world where it was absolutely normal and natural for a white woman, my mother, to be uh, taking instructions, uh, fulfilling the, the request of a black man whom she had enormous admiration for. So, so my connection, if you like, with the freedom struggle came with my mother's milk. It came with, with the home I grew up in and the values of my mom and my dad, Saudi Sex, who took on the bosses, he took on the state, uh, a very controversial, powerful figure in the news quite often. It's a kind of uncomfortable, mixed feeling, half pride, half embarrassment when you see your father's name in headlines uh, in, in, the, in the newspaper. So that was the world I grew up in. It wasn't witnessing a particular aspect of racism. That, that catapulted me later on into the struggle. I was born into the struggle. Hmm. And so how did you become involved with the ANC? I was deeply influenced by my parents' values, but I hated them assuming I'd automatically follow in their footsteps. And um, it was only in my second year at university, uh, I left high school matriculated at age 15, so I was now 17 years old, uh, studying law, uh, and the trigger was a lecture on poetry by an Afrikaans poet called Es Griecher, a very liberated person who'd been in Spain in the 1930s at the time when the fascists destroyed the Republican government there. Uh, and he was giving a lecture on a Spanish poet called Lorca. I didn't even know they had poets in Spain. I thought they had bullfighters only. But Ace walked up and down the stage for maybe two or three hours, speaking in English and Spanish and a bit of French and a bit of Afrikaans. Uh, and he spoke about this poet who was assassinated by the fascists for his belief in democracy for the love poetry that he wrote, uh, for his vision at five in the afternoon. Uh, and he recited a poem by another poet, Spanish language poet, Pablo Neruda, whom I'd never heard of from Chile. Uh, I was thinking that five in the afternoon, at five in the afternoon, when Lorca was killed by the fighting squad of the fascists. Uh, and what that did to me was a love poetry inward, dreaming, longing, something about the world and how I connected up with existence, everything through poetry. But it connected, moved poetry from my inner isolated self to the grand events of the world, to public events. And that energy, if you like, of poetry, linking up 
with the fight against fascism in Spain that immediately echoed, responded to the fight against racism in South Africa. Uh, a few weeks later, I was joining the Defiance of Unjust Wars campaign. Uh, a very kind of direct connection between that lecture on poetry uh, and, and my hurtling myself in, hurling myself in with a young crowd I'd met in what was called the Modern Youth Society. Uh, we couldn't call ourselves the Socialist Society or the Revolutionary Society, so we called ourselves our Modern Youth Society, uh, an innocuous title. And we were black, white, and brown. We defied the color bar in our ranks, in our imaginations, in our work. Uh, and I joined in the Defiance of Unjust Wars campaign. Uh, Dennis Goldberg went on to become Quante Wiesfies, where a very significant commander, organizer of, of the ordinance, 22 years in jail, was there. Mary uh, Butcher, she was Mary Turok in prison afterwards, was a member. Uh, we had Joseph Morrelong, five years in Robben Island, Toivu Yatoivu from Namibia, uh, 12 years in Robben Island, a great leader in Namibia. So these were the people uh, in my youth movement at, at, at that stage uh, that, that I got involved with. And then it wasn't a question of, of conviction. It was there. Apartheid was a daily reminder of why we were in the struggle. It was a question of courage. And the courage... It's, it's not like you have enormous courage to face up to everything for all time. You, you slowly, 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 the state is getting closer and closer, uh, taking pot shots at you in different ways, uh, and you resist each stage. And there were moments during my detention, especially when I had uh, torture by sleep deprivation in the second detention, where I nearly cracked, I, I, I nearly broke, but somehow I managed to survive and to carry on with the struggle. You are born into the struggle. You matriculate and start university at 17, and you decide... Now, I started at 15, 16, and 17, I'm a second-year law student, and I mention that because instead of sending me to jail, the magistrate saw I was a juvenile, and he asked our, any of his parents in court, my mother stood up, and he said, I'm sending you home to, to your mother. Uh, that was a humiliating moment for me. I was actually the leader of the group of whites who sat on a post office seat marked non-whites only. Uh, it's, it's kind of an amusing reflection, but, but it does indicate that it was at a very young stage that I now became actively engaged. Some people, you know, they remember their first kiss. I remember the first time I went to jail. <laughs> and uh, so I was wondering, why did you initially choose to take the legal path as your way of opposing apartheid? Well, you've got to do something, even if it's to answer the questions of your uncles and aunties. Well, Albie, what are you going to do? And at first I said, I'm going to become a doctor. Oh, that's nice. And suddenly I don't know why. I said, I'm going to become a lawyer. Oh, that's nice. Uh, it was just a vague feeling that I wasn't politically engaged. It wasn't specifically to fight apartheid, just a feeling I could do something useful with my life, something socially useful, useful for myself. It was a very vague sentiment at that stage. By the time I graduated, and I'd been overseas for one year, so it was like six years later, I knew. And in fact, the chambers I occupied uh, because you had to find somewhere from which to practice uh, as an advocate in Cape Town, were vacant because Lionel Foreman had been arrested and flown to Joburg on a charge of treason. Uh, and it's amusing to remember he had crappy old furniture because why spend money on furniture when you know you're going to go to jail? And I inherited his, his office and I kept the crappy old furniture for nine years I also didn't bother to change it, because why get smart furniture when you know you're going to jail? You become a, a legal practitioner um, with the inclination towards uh, fighting apartheid, or at least doing something in the world. And so I'm wondering what happened in your life? You've mentioned a few things, a few times you went to jail, 
and uh, how you were tortured by sleep deprivation, but what had happened in your life that you were driven into exile in 1966? Well, let me go back to the practice a little bit. Half my practice was defending people charged under racist laws or the Suppression of Communism Act that was used very widely to ban people, restrict people. And that was the half, half that was most important to me. I never took a penny for a secretly. One of the first rules of practicing as an advocate is thou shalt charge. And taking cases for nothing, you're supposed to report it because it's seen as undercutting the, the, the profession. But I felt how are people being persecuted because they are on the side of justice, uh, not because they've done something wrong. And so I didn't take a penny for those cases. They were tricky, difficult cases, statutes all the time being amended for more and more suppression through the law, not rule of law, but rule by the law. And then the other half of my practice was a little bit of commercial work, criminal work, um, family law, uh, and so on. And I enjoyed it. I loved fly, going to the court with my gown flying behind me. I loved arguing appeals. I loved cross-examining. I hated being in a racist court where all the top officials were white, where if you question a white woman, it will be, tell me, Mrs. Smith, what did you think? If it was a black woman, it will be, now tell us, Maria, or, or tell us, uh, Rosie, what did you see? You know, all these little, tiny little subliminal signs of racism coupled with the overt racism of, of the laws and statutes. Very, very complicated. But it, it sharpened your wits. We had to fight hard. We could expose torture. We could prevent people from getting death sentences to get 10 years jail instead of 25 years jail. Uh, and generally, we could be on the side of the accused. People who would see them after they'd been tortured, uh, ill-treated, but believing that they were human beings, that they had a right to speak, the right to protest. So, so the lawyers played a very, very big role, even when law was at its most repressive. And I'm happy to say there were some very decent judges who really believed in justice, although within a framework of apartheid, they did what they could. They never imposed death sentences. They were willing to keep the ears open if there were allegations of torture, uh, and, and they treated the witnesses and counsel with, with dignity and, and respect. So ultimately, now I'm in jail the second time. Uh, my practice is dwindling. My clients expect me to keep them out of jail, not to go to jail myself. And I'm about to be thrown out of legal practice on, on, on um, uh, under the Suppression of Communism Act. Um, which gave them power to disbar people uh, if they were said to be subversive uh, of the government. Uh, and our movement, this was now 1966, our movement was crushed. Uh, and I felt I either stay uh, and whimper, but I, I can't be active anymore. Our movement's not there, even in the underground it's gone. Or I can leave South Africa, recuperate my strength, carry on the fight from outside. And I asked for an exit permit, it was called. You can leave on the basis you never come back. I was stateless for seven years. Uh, uh, I was in bad shape uh, psychologically in many, many ways, but I got stronger again. I got a PhD in England at Sussex University. Uh, I married Stephanie Kemp, who'd been a client of mine. We had two children growing up there. And, and I had marvelous friends in England, some of them in the anti apartheid movement. But somehow in England at that stage, even when I was happy, I was unhappy. I felt far away. I felt remote. And when Mozambique became independent in 1975, I was able to visit in 76. And wow. That's where I wanted to be. Off, getting off the plane, it's not just the hot sunshine, the air, the light. It's not just seeing a soldier from Frelimo with a gun, a gun on our side, not a gun pointing at us. It was reconnecting with Africa. The sign was Zona Libertad de Humanidad, Liberated Zone of Humanity. 
time of the Mozambican Revolution, a great upsurge in the country, and my courage came back in, in, in Mozambique. And it was 11 years, extraordinary years, of, of elation, of difficulty, of, of seeing immense strains of civil war, uh, terrible calamity hitting the country. Uh, I lost an arm when I was blown up in 1988. There's so many Mozambicans without legs because of landmines, child soldiers, and a very strong conviction that the system they had there, which is people's power, that seemed to be so focused and concerted and uniting everybody in a common revolutionary transformatory project was not the way to go in South Africa. We had to adopt a system of pluralism. We had to win power through the support of the people through elections and not impose it through the will of a ruling party. I learned that not because of any theory, but living in Mozambique and seeing if there's no space for opposition, it goes underground, the country's torn apart. So ironically, in a way, the Mozambique revolutionary, not for its crimes, because it was basically a very honest, authentic upsurge of people's emotions for independence uh, and, and had many gracious and wonderful features to it, but it was seeing that the failure to give space for opposition uh, invites civil war, disruption, uh, and it's better to live in a country, multi-party democracy, and later on I came to uh, be persuaded by the ANC with a Bill of Rights, protecting the rights of people. That was the main way of avoiding the claims of the old regime then for group rights. It would have consolidated group rights in our institutional structures in South Africa, with whites representing whites, Zulus, Zulus, Afrikaners, Afrikaners, ruling by consensus. It would have meant three presidents. Can you imagine Mandela on Monday, Leclerc on Tuesday, Botelesi on Wednesday. In fact, it was one year, one year, one year, having to rule by consensus. We had to fight against that. So it was the struggle while we were in exile, under the leadership of Oliver Tambor, guiding us in what he called the Constitutional Committee he set up, that laid the foundations of what ultimately became the South African Constitution. It's interesting you bring up uh, Oliver Tambor, because I'm sure many young South Africans like me um, have heard of him uh, and surely have heard uh, at least of O.R. Tambo Airport in Cherbourg, but they definitely don't know, well, I at least definitely don't know much about him. And as you mentioned, you just mentioned, you work very closely with him in exile on the Constitutional Committee. And so I was wondering what you two were working together to do, um, and but also what he was like as a person. Right. So the first time I, I worked closely and directly with him was when uh, I, I'm working in Mozambique, helping construct the new legal system there. And, and I get a message from reception in the Ministry of Justice that um, President Oliver Tambo wishes to speak to you on the phone. They're very impressed now that the President of the ANC wishes to speak to me. He asked, can I come to Lusaka? He's very, very polite. He said, if necessary, I can ask um, President Samora Michel to release you for a while. Uh, and I say, no, I think it should be possible. And I'm very curious. And I fly to Lusaka and we go down. It was down off a sanitary lane through the back yard into a very modest office, the office of the president of the ANC. Uh, and he asks me after my health and political situation in Mozambique, and I'm wondering, what's it all about? African style, very courteous. And then he says, Comrade Albi, we've captured a number of enemy agents whom we are holding in detention now, uh, and there's nothing in the ANC constitution about how you treat captured enemy agents. And of course, political party constitutions don't have anything. You can't imagine the Republicans or the Democrats in America, they might wish to have, uh, or the, the Labour Party or Conservatives, what do you do with captured Tories? But they don't. So in a very jaunty 
way I say, well, uh, the international instruments that say no inhuman degrading punishment, no torture. And he says to me, with a very big face, we use torture. I can't believe it. We're fighting for freedom. We use torture. And it ends up with, he says, can I help him and the ANC, the NEC, draft a code of conduct, not only to deal with captured enemy agents, but with comrades who go in for sexual assaults or steal money or drive a car or stab, a whole range of different things. A code of conduct, a form of legality for a movement in exile. Uh, and, and I regard helping to draft that code of conduct. If you said I'm the chief architect of the code of conduct, I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, as probably the most important legal document I've ever drafted. And I worked on the Constitution. Uh, I, I gave many decisions for the Constitutional Court on important issues. But that in exile, possibly the most important. Structuring forms of you punish people after giving them a hearing, the right of defense. Uh, you have grades of uh, violations, some things you don't use tribunals, but for very serious things you have tribunals, uh, and and uh, its key feature accepted at the ANC conference in Cabo in 1985 was no torture. Uh, no torture. And it made a real difference because there have been terrible abuses in the ANC camps. Terrible abuses. Terrible disrespectful human beings, whatever they might have done, whatever the intentions, uh, and that was stopped. There was a change in the personnel of the leadership of security at that stage. And tribunal hearings were organized afterwards. A panel Maduna, who's on the Constitutional Committee, was one of the defending lawyers for somebody who was acquitted. And, and security said, what the hell are you doing, Penwell? You know, you standing up for counter-revolutionaries who are coming here to kill us. And it was very awkward for him, but that was his role given to him by Campbell said, imagine you're in a court anywhere in the world, your job is to defend and bring out the truth. And that, I think, was at a very important moment at a time when we were thinking about a Bill of Rights for a democratic South Africa. Uh, and we'd seen in other countries where people had fought heroically for freedom, that leaders have gone on to become power drunk, uh, abusive in many ways. Uh, and so it wasn't only what we'd seen them do. We had seen power drunk leaders in our own organization. So we opted for a Bill of Rights. It made us look good. It was our strategic answer to group rights, but also we needed a Bill of Rights against ourselves. Uh, and so... By the time we returned to South Africa, we'd accepted certain core constitutional guideline principles democratically by the chosen representatives of the people at the Kabwe conference, at an in-house seminar at the University of Zambia afterwards, at a special seminar organized by the women who were saying, hey, 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 you know, you're not dealing with sexism, you're not dealing with patriarchy, not just there, not just under apartheid, but inside our own organization. Painful, painful, painful debates and discussions. All of this we brought back and shared with people inside South Africa who were fighting similar struggles in the mass democratic movement and in movements right outside of the ANC in their own way, all making their own contributions. And very aware of the fact that there were different streams from the Robertson book where Pan-Africanist Congress, Africanist input, extremely important, from Steve Biko, the Black Consciousness stream, sometimes flowing directly into the ANC, sometimes parallel, sometimes outside, and individuals and, 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 and uh, civil society groups, all resisting and fighting apartheid. And that created the, if you like, the intellectual foundations for our final constitution with very deep African roots. I don't know 
uh, are, are you a lawyer? Have you been studying law? Uh, I, no, I did not study law. I studied uh, politics and economics um, at uh, the University of Leiden here. Okay, so I've got a question for you. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. Do you know when the ANC first adopted a Bill of Rights? No. Okay. Uh, you should be asking the questions. I'm on 1923. It's not generally known. 1944, during World War II, when Churchill and Roosevelt drew up the Atlantic Charter about freedoms after Hitler, the ANC in South Africa was saying, well, what about us? We're sending soldiers to fight against racism, but we have racism in South Africa. And African claims document included a Bill of Rights. You've probably heard of the Freedom Charter. That was 1955 at Cliptown. I happened to be there. So the theme of a Bill of Rights then goes very, very deep in South African history, in African intellectual history. Uh, and finally, at the Constitutional Assembly, that's Parliament now, democratically elected in 1994, two years to adopt the final constitution according to certain key democratic principles. And this parliament consisting overwhelmingly of people who had fought against oppression, of, of trade unionists fighting for the rights of workers, of women fighting for rights of women, women workers, of intellectuals and journalists uh, and, and, and academics and teachers and nurses uh, and, and people working on the land. They were the majority of the people in Parliament saying, this is what we want in our new constitution. It wasn't smart lawyers. It certainly wasn't outsiders. It was South African made by South Africans who'd been in the resistance. And that's why the constitution has such a powerful resonance. It starts with the preamble. You read it. You look through the fundamental features and principles. Where else in the world do you have a constitution that puts non-sexism on a par with non-racism as a foundational principle? Where else in the world do you have a constitution that has such a comprehensive bill of rights that includes not only race, color, creed in the equality clause, but disability, marital status, birth, uh, that includes sexual orientation as a forbidden clause, that includes environmental rights, strong rights for children, that says that, that violence in the freedom clause, violence from the state is prohibited, but also violence from private sources. Maybe the only constitution in the world that denounces, constitutionally denounces gender-based violence, that has an explicit right to make choices over reproduction, these things are in the Constitution because of the strong women's movement in Parliament and the National Coalition of Women outside Parliament. So it's a very resonant doctrine, a, a, a Constitution, built on essential fairness, fairness requiring transformation and change so that it's not simply a promise of equality and, and human dignity and freedom, but these things are realized. So the Constitution, in that sense, becomes an instrument for change, but it doesn't bring about change itself. Uh, it's only when the people are mobilized, claiming their rights, going to court when necessary, but winning their rights in Parliament, in the streets, that's the way we get transformation and change in South Africa. And for me, it was brilliant being on the court, being able to shine some lights, if you like, on justice, on pockets and areas of our life, where there was, was a resistance to the change that was required. This is all um, incredibly, um, what's the word? It, it, it's incredibly inspiring to me to know, to, to see just how impassioned you are uh, about the constitution as someone who's made it and because it's given me such an incredible life. But I do want to pull us back just to, just before, um, the we get to the negotiations the MPNP and I was wondering you were talking at uh, length about how you came at how the ANC drafted its um, <clears throat> Bill of Rights and the Code of Conduct 
uh, the most important legal document you've been involved in. How do you think you managed as the ANC in exile to succeed in not only um, drafting these codes of conduct and coming up with a um, comprehensive governmental structure to be implemented when on return to South Africa, but also how did you not fall apart when you were cast out from the country that you were meant to be a political party in? Right. Well, I, I think it had a huge amount to deal with the uh, road of Oliver Tumble. Uh, I'm not a believer in the great man or great person uh, view of history and makers of history. Uh, but perhaps he was particularly great because he was such a great listener. He was so steeped in the culture and traditions of struggle inside the organization that he was leading, so modest himself, uh, so thoughtful, and he loved ideas, and he loved listening to others, and he was very rigorous with language, with thought. Uh, it, it, it was a pain to be on a drafting committee with him, because he just went on and on and on correcting to get it just right. Uh, even his own speeches that looked to be off the cuff and so on, he'd spend a week writing and changing and writing and changing to get it just right. So that was the meticulous side. But there was that deep humanity uh, and embrace. To me, it, it was a profound form of African nationalism. That was the root of his thinking, the liberation of the oppressed African majority in South Africa not an inward-looking exclusionary African nationalism, but an outward-engaging, all-embracing African nationalism. Uh, as a law student, I used to pass by the office, fly when I traveled, not fly, hitchhike up to Johannesburg. I would go to the office of, of um, Mandela and Tambo just to pay my respects. And either Tambo or Mandela would come and see this young white comrade from Cape Town, I'd be offered a cup of tea by Ruth Mumpati. They'd apologize. I could see how busy they were. But they appreciated that I was coming there to acknowledge my contact and respect with them. Uh, and that sense of embrace that came with a cup of tea, maybe because I joined the Defiance campaign, uh, uh, that, that I, I'd, I'd taken the step they'd called upon, what they call the white compatriots, to take to join them in the struggle. And I've taken that step. Uh, and I felt that all the way through. Uh, I, I'm i very secular. I fought very hard for my right not to pretend a belief I didn't have. I got on so beautifully with Oliver Tumble, who was due to become an Anglican minister to be ordained in, in December 1956. He was going to be ordained. He was going to marry Adelaide. And poah, the treason trial. Arrested thrown into jail, set up a choir immediately, carried on the struggle for years in the treason trial, sent out of the country to keep the ANC together externally, to call for the international boycotts, to help prepare for a return to South Africa. Uh, and he managed all those things, never losing his composure, never losing his capacity to embrace the different people, uh, and, and finding strength from having people with ideas around him. So for example, the critical idea of the Bill of Rights came from Palo Jordan, a, a brilliant intellectual uh, son of A.C. Jordan, the first black professor at the University of Cape Town, uh, a wonderful scholar of also literature. Uh, and, and, and Palo was very independent. And he came up with this idea of a Bill of Rights to preempt all the attempts to secure a future for the whites, an entrenched future, a privileged future for the white, through group rights uh, of, of the Bill of Rights. And, and OR, as we called him, loved having people like uh, uh, Palo Jordan. He loved people like Mac Maharaj, very brilliant, sharp, spiky, doing underground work, communicating because uh, his, his, his wife happened to work for, um, for IBM, I think it was, uh, and the very, almost one of the very first users of internet, it's not very well known, 
it was used to get communication with, with Nelson Mandela in prison in the 1980s. Uh, and he loved engaging with people like Mac. Uh, and, and he loved having people like Ruth Mampati as part of the team. And when people like Ruth and the others were complaining that women were be being given the role of sandwich makers and tea makers and typists, and we want to fight and we want to be taken seriously, uh, he, he loved that challenge. And he said, organize yourselves. Don't just make it an individual coming and speaking to me as president. Become strong as an organized militant group inside the ANC and bring home to all the comrades, male and female, that a huge potential a reservoir of, of energy, of thought of commitment is being marginalized and suppressed because of patriarchal attitudes. So it was his facility, if you like, of mind, his openness, being a natural Democrat, that uh, made him the brilliant leader that he was. He loved ideas, he loved useful, correct expression, he loved comradeship, he wasn't in it for himself, he wasn't in it for, for glory, he wasn't in it for power, he certainly wasn't in it for money, he was in it for, for the people. We say these things, but he lived it. And when the person at the top lives those values. It, it somehow provides a, an exemplar for everybody. That becomes the norm. If the person at the top is venal and given to conspiracies uh, and, and becomes engaged in corruption and so on, that becomes the norm and that has to be resisted. With OR in circumstances of, of exile, he, he represented everything that we were fighting for, that we believed in, the moral, the intellectual values, the, the, the sociability. The, we didn't use the term Ubuntu then, but if you like, Ubuntu in action uh, in, 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 in very, very powerful ways. Uh, that's why you know, I belong to that generation who remembers him and Albert Maturi before him with, with, with enormous uh, respect and, and honor and pride. You come home in 1990 with um, the agreements of the ANC, well, with the agreement with the National Party, and the ANC comes expecting the negotiations um, to happen for the new South African democracy. But my first question about this period is what was it like finally being able to return home, and what had changed since you'd been gone? You know, for, for a number of us, it was brilliant. We were coming back on our terms. We were had a clear vision of what we wanted. We were totally convinced we would get a democratic constitution and a transformatory one. So it was brilliant. For many people coming back, it was awful. They'd been away 20, 25 years. Some of them hadn't used money for 20, 25 years. Uh, they, they hadn't got university degrees, they hadn't become doctors or lawyers or, uh, or trained farmers, whatever it might be. Uh, and they back to a busy capitalistic society where money is everything, uh, and they felt very displaced and it was difficult for them to reintegrate and many were not respected and honored. But certainly for me and our team, it, it was terrific, intellectually challenging, it was exciting to be back home, and we just felt we've made the major breakthrough. We've got out of jail, we're back from exile, we have a clear vision of the country that we want, we want elections, we want a democratic body to draft our constitution, we're on the road. And so what were your feelings about uh, the prospects for the first Codisa negotiations? I, I wasn't high up in the negotiations. Uh, I was very happy to be part of the Constitutional Committee, working on different models and possibilities to put to the body that would draft the Constitution, but busy all the time. And speaking at universities, I was based at UWC. I would often go to uh, UCT. And I even remember one day I gave a, a talk at UWC on why we needed a Bill of Rights. And there was such a passionate response from the students 
prepare a bill of rights. We're going to have rights. The law will be on our side. The law will enable us to break through. And the next day I went to UCT. It's overwhelmingly white students. And I feel I can't give a different talk. It's not a different bill of rights for white students. But they also delighted. Yes, we can have justice in South Africa. And we're not going to be driven out of our homes. We're not going to be humiliated. There's going to be a place for us. There's going to be a place for us in a democratic South Africa where equality will be meaningful and we can contribute what skills we've got. Uh, and it was very, uh, it was a very valuable lesson for me, speaking to the two audiences, not to have one talk on the Bill of Rights for black students and another talk for white students. It's got to be the same talk the same Bill of Rights for everybody. And so black students will know that our white compatriots are part of the nation and have the same fundamental rights that everybody has. The white students will know that there will be disruption, there will be change, there will be an expansion and a sharing of things that they've taken for granted. Uh, that, that was valuable in my head to convincing me of the importance and character of the Bill of Rights and became valuable later when I'm on the bench. And you're sitting up there, and it's for the nation. It's for everybody. It's not for the privileged, whether it's the privileged few, privileged by their skin color, or the privileged who took part in, in the struggle, who are now in positions of authority and power, or the privileged who belong to particular faith, or the privileged because they happen to be men. Uh, no or privileged because they happen to own a lot of money. Uh, it, it's, it's in that sense, it was the struggle that was preparing me for being a judge afterwards, but not using the same instruments we had to use in struggle. We didn't need armed struggle now to enforce the Bill of Rights. We had the law on our side. We had the possibilities of the law serving the people, not oppressing the people. And we had to give texture to that possibility, meaning in the concrete situations that came before us, uh, the impact on the lives of ordinary people who were vulnerable, who were dispossessed, who were marginalized, who were being left out, who couldn't get their rights through the political process for one reason or another. Uh, we, as a court, had to be attentive to their very just aspirations that were being limited by race, by patriarchy, by systems of ownership, uh, of dispossession, of, of historic marginalization. And so you have an incredible feeling of goodwill within South Africa going into the negotiations. And yet, um, I think it was in late 1992, no, in early mid-1992, the Codisa negotiations break down. And so I'm wondering, what was it that um, on the ANC side that led to the Codice negotiations being unsuccessful? Okay. Uh, you say there was an enormous amount of goodwill. There wasn't. There was an enormous amount of tension going into negotiations. As far as the regime was concerned, it was being forced upon them. And there was a lot of turbulence inside the National Party ranks uh, with the right wing threatening insurrection. It was very complicated and difficult. And we had massacres. We had people being killed. There was violence going on. There was low-grade civil war in KZN. Uh, there was terrible fighting going on between ANC youth and Azapu youth, often being stimulated by the Third Force government. So it was very rough from the beginning. But there was no turning back. There was no alternative except continued violence and destruction for everybody. So uh, the, the breakdown at, at Kudessa 1, the first in 1992, came about because there basically there was a clash of two visions. The ANC vision was a non-racial democracy, all equal, undivided South Africa, with fundamental rights being protected by a Bill of Rights that protected rights of individuals and communities, but not represented as 
communities as such as racial groups, ethnic groups in government. That was ANC position. The regime position was no, we fear domination, uh, we fear suppression, and the only protections we can have will be through a shared presidency uh, with the three leading parties providing the president. That would have meant Mandela, uh, de Klerk, and Butelezi ruling by consensus. And there was no possibility of compromise or halfway house on those visions. For the one to win, the other had to die. Uh, and that was the foundation. The trigger was the Boy Patong massacre. The trigger was the fact that we still had prisoners on Robben Island. Two years after the release of Mandela and unbanning of the ANC, uh, there was still the violence going on. These were the triggers, but the cause was that clash of visions. And then when the ANC withdrew, the response was rolling mass action, but disciplined, organized, with a clear vision. And the world could see, South Africans could see, uh, ANC had overwhelmingly support, and it was organized, disciplined support in favor of its project. And that was when the big cracks in the National Party appeared and a majority led by people like Rolf Mayer and Leon Vessels and others, majority got acceptance of the fundamental ANC vision as the way forward, subject to two limitations only, and they were both temporary. The one was a government of national unity for five years, but national unity within the framework of United South Africa. And the other was a, a sunset clause for not dismissing people from the public administration uh, for a certain period. Uh, and, and these were accommodations which the ANC accepted. They were temporary. And now we left with the constitution that doesn't have any traces of, of those particular aspects. So from the multi-party negotiation process onwards, big battles over what should go into the principles that would have to guide the uh, Constitutional Assembly, Parliament, elected Parliament, drafting the final constitution. Big battles over the temporary arrangements. Should there be an interim government, which the ANC first insisted on, and then said, okay, we don't want to be in government with you. It's too confusing. But we want to make sure that there's an independent electoral body. We want to make sure there's freedom of speech and political, or political campaigning. Uh, we have laws guaranteeing those aspects. Uh, uh, and finally, we got the uh, constitution. It was only after the assassination of Chris Harley almost scuppered everything after the, um, the, the, the massacre, uh, the violence in Bopetotswana, it was after the right wing had agreed not, there were 20,000 white men with guns, half in the army, half outside, waiting to seize the negotiators and take them to Unita held territory in Angola Unita having been supported by the South African regime, uh, they decided instead uh, to cooperate with the process to come into parliament. It was after uh, 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 Mangosuta had finally agreed to come into the process after threatening secession and, and rebellion in KZN. I, I mention this to say it was rough all the way through, right to the very end but we got the elections. And the elections were the huge act of self-determination of the South African people. That was when, if you like, we became independent. We didn't become a just society, we didn't become a fair society, but became a democratic society, an open society. It wasn't a flag going up and a flag coming down, though we did change flags. It was millions of people voting, voting as equals. That was the cement, if you like, that provided the, the firm foundations 
for the new democratic South Africa. And so we've got these huge battles being fought within the MPNP all the while there is an um, <clears throat> incredible amount of pressure from the outside for the negotiations to crumble and for something worse to take its place. But I'm wondering, what was your role specifically during the MPNP? What were you um, trying to achieve? Well, I was part of the uh, ANC, not the Negotiations Commission, but the, uh, the legal team helping to explain the process that had to be followed. So uh, the basic vision of how to move forward consisted of we're accused of wanting simple majoritarianism and a constitution that will give all power to the ANC when they elected to office. Not true. What we are arguing for is one person, one vote elections to create a parliament using proportional representation because we wanted everybody there. We didn't want anybody to say this is not my constitution. This is an ANC constitution. We want even the smallest groups there. And no minimum threshold, no 2%. If we'd had a 2% threshold, the Democratic Party wouldn't have made it. Uh, the PAC wouldn't have made it. The ZAPA wouldn't have made it uh, into the new parliament. So they were there in the Constitutional Assembly. Then, critically, we set out principles negotiated in advance at Kempton Park that would be binding on the constitution-making body. And if you look at the principles, you'll see that none of them prevented change and transformation in South Africa. They were all compatible with major radical transformation. They opened the door to that. Uh, and those principles then had to be complied with by Parliament. Who would decide if Parliament had complied? It couldn't decide itself. So that was when the decision was made to have a constitutional court. That's the irony in South Africa. The constitutional court was set up precisely to ensure that the constitutional principles agreed to in advance would be complied with by the constitution-making body. Then, once we're going to have a constitutional court, we might as well make it the top court for all constitutional matters. And we've kept that term, constitutional court, ever since then. And finally, finally, uh, Parliament had to adopt by a two-thirds majority. And uh, in fact, this extraordinary constitution, possibly the most progressive in the world, was adopted by 83% with a number of ob uh, abstentions, representing as strongly as one could want the will of the South African people. Then once that was adopted, it became law. In fact, it was sent back to us, to the court. Uh, I think it was May the 7th or 8th it was adopted. Uh, Ululation in Parliament, the marvellous double Beckel speech, I'm an African, sent to the Constitutional Court. And what did we do? We declared the Constitution to be unconstitutional. We said, although overwhelmingly it complies with the principles in nine respects it didn't. We sent it back. Changes were made. We'd spent 10 days hearing objections from the public. We accepted nine of the objections, sent it back. Uh, finally, we could certify the changes. I think it was on the 4th of December, 1996, were okay. And on the 10th of December, Nelson Mandela signed it into law at, at Sharpville. Uh, and it became... Law came into effect, I think, on February the 4th, 1997. And so, Mr. Sachs, you've out detailed an incredible amount about the negotiating process, but in many ways, your more significant contribution to the Constitution came after the negotiations in which Nelson Mandela placed you on uh, the first Constitutional Court. 
And so I was wondering, um, why were you appointed to the Constitutional Court? I've been heavily engaged from 1985 onwards uh, on the Constitutional Committee of the ANC. And then in 1994, before the first democratic elections, there was a whole group of us, uh, Zodas Guia, uh, Penel Maduna, uh, Kada Asmo, uh, and a number of others on the Constitutional Committee. But they all stayed on in politics. And I had this feeling now, democratic elections, about to start the lifetime's dream of voting as equals for the first time. And there were four of us from the Constitutional Committee on the National Executive of the ANC. And the question was, who would become the Minister of Justice? And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I haven't been in the struggle to worry, will my phone ring? But if I can be a judge on the Constitutional Court, that'll be fantastic. So I withdrew from the ANC in the very last moments of the pre-democratic era, before the first elections, uh, and, and to be available in that way. And other people of my generation went on in politics. Kada Asma became the Minister of Water Affairs and Public Education. Azodas Guia became the Minister of, of uh, a very important afterwards of social administration, public administration, social security. Uh, another person was um, uh, Dada Omar. He became the first Minister of Justice. They did excellent work in their own ways. But I, from that group, was available to be on the Constitutional Court. So maybe that's one reason why I was chosen. Uh, I lived and studied and worked as a lawyer in independent African countries. I felt that that was a special contribution I could make. Uh, I practiced at the bar in Cape Town. So I, I think I had a, a very varied experience that made me a suitable candidate. And so there was some initial controversy when you were appointed, but what was that about? Well, there, there was a group at Wits University who wanted John Dugard to get the seat on the court. And John should have been on the court. He did terrific work inside South Africa, fighting for constitutionalism, fighting against the Bantustans, fighting over Namibia, and fighting for rights for workers and so on. And so they felt the only way for John to get on the court was to keep LB Sachs out. They had calculated the numbers. So uh, there was quite a heavy um, uh, 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 critique of, 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 of my position uh, at the hearing before the Judicial Service Commission uh, that came from that particular grouping. And I can understand and even sympathize with their motivation, even though it was very painful for me at the time. In your time on the Constitutional Court, what were some of the most important initial cases that you were adjudicating on? The very first one was capital punishment. 400 people on death row uh, accumulated. There hadn't been executions now for a couple of years during negotiations, and their lives depended on us. It wasn't just that. For those of us who were revolted by capital punishment, it was just another example of cruelty, uh, of somehow making your country better by killing people. Uh, and and uh, it, it was a very significant marker between the old apartheid race of South Africa, which was very authoritarian, also very cruel, making way for the new South Africa envisaged by the constitution that wasn't only non-racist and non-sexist, uh, not only provided protections for everybody on an equal basis, not only envisaged transformation of society, but also wasn't cruel in, in, in its operations. But, you know, each case we decided was like a test case. We didn't have precedent. We couldn't use the precedent of the outer apartheid courts. So we had to establish ground rules, a style of work, 
a methodology in terms of interpretation, a vision of the role of the judges, creating as we went along, case by case, benefiting from international practice and experience, drawing heavily on, on work by judges in other courts, but always animated by the text and spirit and values of our constitution. And so I mentioned earlier on that um, you've been referred to as the chief architect of the constitution, and uh, you had to, a little bit to say about that, but I'm still wondering, how do you think your work on the constitutional court shaped uh, the final South African constitution? Well, I was part of the 10 judges, one was ill with German measles at the time, who had to certify the constitutional text as being compliant with the agreed principles. Uh, and, and I had quite a strong role in particular areas, but I'm not going to disclose them. These were inner workings uh, of, of the court. So that was a direct impact on the constitutional text. But I think what I contributed, uh, apart from helping to construct the two-stage process of constitution making and delineate it in terms that were understandable and acceptable, uh, on the court itself, uh, I contributed maybe one or two very specific things. Uh, and there I was very much helped by the collegial nature of the court. A lot of the heavy lifting in the structure of judgment writing and thinking was done by former judges was done by new two new judges, that's Arthur Chesterson and Ishmael Muhammad. Ishmael was so brilliant, I can't tell you. Arthur was astonishingly sound and deep and thoughtful. So once we had the heavy lifting being done by them, and uh, Ivan Mohoro introducing themes like Ubuntu, and Kato Regan, and Pius Langer with a wonderful sensibility, Tori Madala, uh, Johan Krichler, Laurie Ackermann, Richard Goldstone, marvelous thinkers, human beings, uh, totally in tune with, with, with uh, John Didcot, with, with, with the new constitutional vision. Uh, it gave me scope for a certain style of presentation, mode of presentation, uh, writing judgments with very strong opening paragraphs, setting the scene. That was something I pushed for very hard. It became standard. Having a strong wrap-up at the end uh, so that the person reading all the way through, I would start of this case is basically about some, something of that kind. And then at the end, uh, I think... Uh, more than any other of the judges at that stage, I drew on people like uh, Saul Pleitsch, uh, 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 M.K. Gandhi, to provide background contextual historical materials for coming to our positions. Uh, very early on in Capital Punishment, uh, referring to African traditional leaders who'd been against capital punishment and the strong internal culture of African people, blood doesn't follow blood. Uh, uh, I think themes like that uh, had an influence. Uh, one of my colleagues, when told that uh, I was about to be interviewed by not yourself but somebody else, uh, said, that's wonderful. Albie will give you the poetry. Uh, I will give you the nuts and bolts. Uh, so uh, I like to feel that I was uh, at least knowledgeable about the nuts and bolts, which were foundational to the poetry. But the poetic vision was not just verbal flourishes. It, it dealt with the humane culture uh, in which rights 
had to function and operate, uh, and and the points of reference, uh, and 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 the um, supporting analogies and arguments and so on. Maybe I went a little bit further than most of my colleagues, with with texture like that in my judgment writing, uh, and I think you'll find that uh, some of the themes, stylistic themes that I introduced have been picked up and become almost normal uh, in, in the formatting of judgments uh, and, and the register and tone of judgments. Uh, so I think that was a very specific uh, contribution. Uh, some of the right areas where I was invited to, to contribute, or I jumped in and contributed with maybe with a very special uh, timbre, uh, would include um, uh, the rights of same sex people, uh, same sex couples to express their love, affirm themselves, right to dignity, uh, where my writing went beyond the traditional formatting of argument. Uh, including Foucault, uh, Du Bois, in the experience of living in a country where you're not regarded as a full human being. Uh, uh, I introduced intersectionality uh, uh, into legal reasoning in the um, National Coalition of Lesbian Gay Equality case dealing with, with sodomy. I happened to have an African-American law clerk who introduced me to critical race feminism. And I saw the value of intersectionality in getting away from very strict classificatory reasoning towards reasoning being informed by deep values with the overlap of, of different elements of the Constitution. Uh, I think I encourage that kind of direction. And then the other area where uh, I think I had maybe a special influence was um, introducing feminist reasoning, not in a formal sense, but very influenced by uh, feminist colleagues I'd had, uh, I'd associated with, uh, the way of the insider-outsider dimension, looking at the impact of laws and practices very strongly and not just the intention of, of the law and the lawmaker. Uh, so this came through in the cohabitation case where I, the majority position I adopted uh, in, in Box v. Robinson, uh, maybe 15 years ago, uh, earlier this year, uh, 2020, became the majority position of the court uh, because of uh, the, the looking at the impact of the laws on lived reality uh, of special importance to the, the indirect but very severe way in which uh, patriarchal laws and practices could impact on, on, on women. Uh, intersectionality, again, was picked up uh, by the Constitutional Court uh, in a case earlier this year dealing with the rights of domestic workers to occupational, to protection for occupational uh, um, injury, saying that domestic workers didn't have to be women, uh, didn't have to come from poor families, didn't have to be vulnerable, but overwhelmingly domestic workers in South Africa were black women from poor families, uh, very vulnerable and very in need of the protection of the law. So it's, it's themes of that kind that, uh, yeah, the Laugh It Off case was another example of uh, the, the the T-shirts uh, produced challenging logos uh, and challenging calling black label uh, with the T-shirt saying, uh, 
calling black labor instead of South Africa's lusty, lively beer, uh, 300 years of oppression of work or something like that. And, and Carling were very upset and said, you can't use our logos to sell your t-shirts. And I wrote about, again, piggybacking on a very fine judgment by Michael Mosinecki, balancing out the freedom of speech elements as against the uh, uh, the protection of property rights. Uh, I wrote about the importance of laughter. Does the law have a sense of humor? And laughter, satire, parody in particular, being the elixir of democracy, uh, the oxygen to, to provide democracy. It's not just the right to laugh. Uh, it's important for the very nature of the democratic uh, project and process. So it's, it's, it's elements like that that maybe I was a little more daring than many of my colleagues uh, that I introduced uh, into the uh, in, into, into the legal firmament. Uh, some people loved it, some people hated it, some just smiled or went along. Uh, but it, that's the strength of a court. It has different judicial sensibilities, uh, modes of expression, representation. We come together, we work together, and we impart our own uh, particularities in that way that enrich the whole. And maybe these were some areas in which I uh, was able to contribute something uh, of, 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 of um, lasting value. You have certainly contributed quite a lot in terms of legal framework uh, to in South Africa. And I'm wondering, with all of what you have contributed, what are you the most proud of contributing to the South African Constitution and to uh, South Africa in general? You know, that that's an unfair question. And I'm going to plead like a Fifth Amendment. It's like saying, which is your favorite child? Uh, and, and um, you know, if people ask me when I was on the bench, what's your favorite case? I'd say it's the one I'm working on at the moment. The minute it's over, it's gone. The one you're on, you become passionate about. Looking back now, I can't use that pretext to, to escape anything. Uh, but, but I can really emphasize uh, it, it was um, it was hard being on the court. It was lonely. It, it, it sounds strange. Very collegial court. Wonderful colleagues. You're working as a team, but in the end, it's you and your conscience. And sometimes it's only me. And I've got ten other colleagues, and they're brilliant, and I love them, and they're thoughtful. But I think they're wrong. And and. Uh, I don't care if, if it, and not only I think they're wrong, I want to express myself maybe writing a longer judgment than all their judgments put together, uh, ex uh, explaining the difference. So um, it, it was a golden period of my life. Uh, that, that sense of delight and honor and, and curiosity. Uh, as a child, I used to wonder, what will I do when I'm big, when I grow up? Will I fly to the moon? Will I discover microbes smaller than Pasteur found? Uh, will I sail around the world? It was none of those. It was being on the founding court of the constitutional uh, era, uh, working with amazing colleagues, wonderful colleagues, uh, fighting with them. Sometimes even we cried, we cried of, after meetings. Very, very intense, very emotional, wrapped up in language, in words, in words, 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 but words became representations of thought and of experience and, and of society. So it, it, it was, on, on the day I left, people came with the TV cameras, well, Justice Sachs, how do you feel on your last day? And I said, I don't want to go. I was like a child. 
I don't want, but how do you feel? I said, that's how I feel. I don't want to go. Uh, and I was actually almost in a state of depression for a year. I got three honorary degrees. I had a book published. I got a medal in front of Obama, but I felt really down before I reconnected with the world. And it took me a whole year to get over leaving the court. And then I started bouncing again. And as you can see, I'm still pretty bouncy. <laughs> you definitely are. And so I want to end um, our conversation today by pulling forward what we've talked about to the present, because the South African constitution has come under recent attack, attack from a number of different angles. And I think generally that what is helping these tax is that there is now a lack of a sense of ownership of the document by um, people from my generation, certainly the born freeze, and, but for also people who didn't necessarily understand quite what the stakes were when the document was written. And so I'm wondering, why is the South African constitution still relevant in the way that it is currently formulated? Well, I think it's got two huge uh, things going for it. Uh, and they're connected. The one is it was the product of struggle, of, of dreams, of imagination, and in intense collegiality and intelligence. Uh, it's very, very rich document. Uh, and my generation, in a sense, have failed in, in as much as we take it for granted that people understand how momentous the transition has been and how magnificent that text is. Uh, and we have to tell those stories. And, and uh, a book that's coming out very soon and in fact, the manuscript is going to the typographers next week. That's the week after this recording. Uh, dear comrade president, inverted commas, how Oliver Tambo laid the foundations of South Africa's constitution, I think will be exciting for your generation to read. It's, it's a very dynamic, rich story with many twists and turns, uh, almost completely unknown. Uh, uh, and, and I think that will give people a sense of amazement and pride in, in what we achieved. Uh, and then culminating in the Constitutional Assembly, basically consisting overwhelmingly of freedom fighters with freedom in their hearts before many had become corrupted, before many had become tired, before many had become routinists, uh, at, at the height of uh, transformatory ambition projecting to the future. So that's one whole side that I think is, is important and significant. But the other is, if you took it away, it would be disastrous. We would have forms of dictatorship. We would have military taking over. We would have domination and oppression coming in new forms. Uh, People, South Africans, speak their minds. They've won, we've won our freedom. And we will lose all that if the Constitution goes. So the Constitution gives us the remedies, the mechanisms, through organization, mobilization, consciousness raising, protest, through legislation, through parliament, through elections, through going to court to uphold rights, to bring about the changes we want. And so many of the people who feel alienated by the constitutional project in general don't hesitate to rush to court to vindicate their rights. Uh, as long as that's happening, and as we're talking now, it's happening. The people in court right now, as we're talking now in different cases and so on, happen to be some of the most virulent critics of the constitution, but they gain into and with the court processes, some are involved in the selection of judges because the constitutional project is, is so important. And, and my hope is that through interviews like this, through the work of the constitution, through work that many of us are doing on the Constitutional Hill Trust based on Constitution Hill, 
that prism site, site of humiliation, domination, brutality, being converted with the constitutional court there into a site of hope, of illumination, of, 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 of human dignity, quality, freedom, uh, we are hoping that that sense of ownership can return. Uh, the pride when the constitution was first adopted, the I am an African speech by Tabo Mbeki, the relation in parliament at that time, maybe some of that spirit can return and people can see the constitution is the product of struggle, of dreams, of energy, of hope, and the constitution provides us with the mechanisms for continuing the struggle, if you like, to continue the struggle. Uh, and, and therefore, people will identify more and more with the constitutional project, identifying by using it, by uh, seeing the potential that it offers, and by filling it out with, with reality because they're invoking the, the, the broad stroke uh, instruments that are established by the Constitution. Well, Mr. Sachs, it has been an incredible privilege to be able to hear some of your stories today. I am blown away not only by your, what you've contributed to my life in terms of the South Africa I got to grow up in, but also by what you faced and the way in which you seem to have taken all the adversity and turned it on its head as a motivator to achieve something truly miraculous. So thank you so much for the honor of granting me the honor of talking to you. It's been a delight. Thank you. I love the sound of my own voice. So I grab every opportunity I, I can get uh, to communicate some of these things. And thank you for having this program.